In this series of videos, we're going to take a look how to actually calculate the values from a neural network. A neural network has an input layer and an output layer, but something happens in between, and we're going to see what happens in between and how we actually calculate those values. The values are based on training weights, and there's another process that goes on called training a neural network where we define those weights to get the correct output. That's not what we're going to focus on right now. Right now we're going to focus on, in this series, how a neural network actually comes up with the values for the output given a certain number of weights. We'll see how to set those weights later. Okay, as you'll recall from other videos that I have on here, a neural network basically has a input layer and an output layer. This input layer and output layer both have a certain number of neurons. We looked at the exclusive OR before, so that'll be a good model for this one because we want something simple that doesn't have too many numbers in it so that I can show you how to calculate a simple network. Then more complex networks just add additional steps that you need to go through to because there's additional weights, but the same way that you do it is the same. So for the exclusive OR, we're going to have two inputs and one output. Two input neurons, one output neuron. And these are both layers. Now before, I said there was something that went on between the input and output layer. And what goes on is determined by the type of neural network that we have. Let's stick just with the feed-forward neural network and see what it looks like. We'll look at some of the other types as well, but a feed-forward neural network has hidden layers. For an XOR, exclusive OR, you really only need one hidden layer. But just so you can see how multiple hidden layers work together, let's create one with two. Two hidden layers will still learn the exclusive OR, it's just going to be something of overkill. So we're going to have hidden one, that's just the first hidden layer, and hidden two. And that's the second hidden layer. Now just like the inputs and the outputs, these hidden layers also have neuron counts. So we're going to say that the first hidden layer has three, the second hidden layer has two. So we're going to look at this neural network in this way as a series of layers. Now this is a feed-forward neural network, which means that it's fed forward you are going to process input here, which will be numbers coming in. So like 0, 1. That's going to be processed by the input layer, flow forward, then to here. The output from each layer goes on to the next layer. And then finally, you get something back. It's only one output neuron, so there's only going to be one number coming back. Exclusive OR for 0 and 1 is going to produce a 1. Now, hit neural networks are often drawn this way, where you draw the layers rather than the individual neurons. We can draw the individual neurons, and it's important to do so for this neural network so that we can really see how everything fits together. It's impractical to draw all of the neurons if the neural network gets fairly big. Imagine if there was 100 input neurons and maybe 50 output neurons and several hundred neurons in each of the hidden layers. This is not all that uncommon. So this is why you usually visualize the neural network as a series of layers like this. But let's go ahead and look at it as a as all of the individual neurons. First I'm going to draw the two input neurons, 
input 1, and input 2. The first hidden layer will be similar. and H3. The next hidden layer, I'm going to also call the this um, H1 and H2, however it's, it's really the second layer, just and then finally we're going to have output 1. Those are all of the neurons. They are connected by, with connections. The, it's a fully connected network, so you're going to have input 1 connected to H1. It's going to be connected to H2 and also to H3 of the first hidden layer. Likewise, input 1, or input 2, is going to be connected in a similar way. The connections propagate on downward to the next layers. And then finally H3 here. These are the connections. These are the actual weights that the neural network has that determine what it's going to output. So you can see every neuron in one layer is connected to the next layer, and so on and so forth. Nothing skips a layer, and nothing flows back to a previous layer. There are other types of neural networks where this happens. If a neuron is connected to itself, that's called a self-connected neural network or a self-connection, if a neuron skips a layer and goes to the entire next one, that's short circuiting. And if a neuron is connected back into the neural network, that is a recurrent neural network. So those happen as well, and we're going to look at those types of networks as well. Now another important aspect of the neural network is that each of these layers also has something called biases. The bias at least in a NCOG neural network, when you specify the layers like you see here, the bias is stored on the layer that is providing the bias to the next layer. So the, the um, input layer never has a bias in a NCOG neural network because there's nothing feeding to it. The hidden layer 1 would likely have a bias. You usually put a bias on every single layer in the neural network that supports it. I'm just going to draw a blue dot next to the layers that actually have biases, so you would specify this. This means that there is a fake sort of virtual connection coming from the layer that precedes the bias to the layer that has the bias. Now the biases will be a little more clear when we look at them actually as neurons. So I am going to go ahead and put in the biases for each of the layers. So B1, B1, and B1. So the bias is going to be fully connected as well 
it goes to every single neuron in the next layer. Oops, there's no connection there. So you can see that the biases do not have any input coming into them. They're not fed from the previous layer. They all have a value of 1. So they are always fed 1. They have weights to each of the neurons in the layer that they're connected to, but they, they have a constant input of 1. What this does is this gives the this gives each of the layers a non-zero input that can adjust the, the hyperplane of what, the, what, the, neural net, what the, uh, the neuron is able to produce. This allows the, neuro, the neural network to learn things even when the regular inputs are all coming in as zero, at least you have something outside of that range. Biases let the neural network learn things that it might not normally be able to learn, and it also tends to converge faster when these bias neurons are there. They're not a special case. By default, NCOG always makes use of biases. You should specify in a NCOG neural network on the individual layers that you want them to be fed by a bias. So you can see it kind of almost looks flipped. But this gives you a place to specify where, and you can also specify biases of other than one. That's fairly rare, but it does seem to be useful in some cases. I really have not worked with those. But this shows you the entire structure of the neural network, complete with the biases and the actual connections between the layers. All of these connections together are the weight matrices that you have in the neural network. In this neural network, there is actually a total of three weight matrices. The weight matrices occur at the connection between layers. So there's one, two, and three. These will be very important when we calculate the neural network's values, which we'll see in the next part. We're going to take all of the weights for the first weight matrix, matrix, also called a synapse in NCOG terminology. Then we're going to calculate what that output is. That output is going to be three numbers, which are fed into the second weight matrix. And we're going to calculate that. And it's going to go on to the the next layer, and then finally to the output layer. And since we only have one output neuron, this is going to give us one single output value. This shows you nearly everything that is at work in the neural network, but there's one other important aspect of this. And this is called the activation function, or sometimes called the transfer function. These occur actually right at the intersection between the layers. So right here, right here, and right here. So those are the activation functions. The output passes through the activation function that scales it after it's calculated and about to go into this, the first hidden layer. Then this is all calculated and it goes through the activation function and then it finally goes through the final activation function. Now we're going to see mathematically how this all happens in the next part. But this gives you an idea of the overall structure of the neural network.